Before we go any further, this is where the story darkens. Not gradually, not symbolically, but almost completely. What you're about to hear isn't just the story of an extinction on Earth. It's the story of what happens when a world's life support systems begin to fail. In this chapter, we'll move through the most severe collapse life has ever faced, and then widen the lens beyond Earth itself. Because sometimes, to understand what it means to survive, we have to look at a world that didn't. And before we go further, take a breath. Because this is where the numbers get truly staggering. Because now we arrive at the Permian-Triassic extinction. 252 million years ago, the Great Dying. It's the most severe mass extinction event in Earth's history. That name alone, the Great Dying, it feels biblical. And it was. Forests collapsed. Coral reefs disappeared entirely. Life on Earth came terrifyingly close to ending. What caused something that catastrophic? The evidence points to an unimaginable series of volcanic eruptions in what's now Siberia. Over hundreds of thousands of years, they formed a vast igneous province known as the Siberian Traps, literally millions of cubic kilometers of lava erupting onto the surface. That scale is hard to picture, like continents drowning in lava. More than that, the lava wasn't even the most dangerous part. As it tore through sedimentary rock, it released huge amounts of greenhouse gases, CO2 and methane, into the atmosphere. Global temperatures surged by up to 8 to 10 degrees C. That's beyond climate change. That's climate collapse. It caused ocean acidification, reducing marine biodiversity. Oxygen levels plummeted. The oceans became anoxic, meaning large swathes were completely devoid of oxygen, essentially underwater dead zones. So both land and sea were suffocating. Yes, an acid rain likely followed, stripping vegetation and disrupting ecosystems further. Combined, these factors created a chain reaction a planetary death spiral. Was there any refuge? Any corner of the planet untouched? Possibly some high-latitude regions or isolated ecosystems, but the devastation was global. Even the insects, which usually fare better in extinction events, suffered major losses. What was life like after? Bleak. The post-extinction Earth was a desolate place. For millions of years, biodiversity remained low. Recovery was slow. Forests took time to regrow. Coral reefs didn't return for 10 million years. Entire ecological niches were just... gone. And yet, somehow, something survived. Yes. The survivors tended to be generalists, organisms that could handle a range of conditions. One of the most famous is Lystrosaurus, a pig-sized herbivore with a squat body and a stubby face. Fossils of it have been found across what is now Africa, Asia, and Antarctica. Lystrosaurus, Earth's first great colonizer? In a way. It dominated the land for millions of years after the extinction, one of very few vertebrates to thrive in that aftermath. It's incredible to think that everything alive today is descended from what made it through that bottleneck. Absolutely. The Permian-Triassic extinction was a genetic purge. Every species alive now comes from survivors of that planetary reset. And I can't help but notice the causes of that event, greenhouse gases, warming, acidification, they sound eerily familiar. Many scientists have noticed too. That's why this extinction gets talked about a lot in climate change discussions. It's the closest analog we have for what runaway global warming can do. So, when people ask, what's the worst that could happen? The answer is in the rock record. Exactly. The Great Dying shows what happens when Earth's natural systems spiral out of balance. And the parallels are unsettling. Because unlike volcanic eruptions, our emissions aren't accidental. They're chosen. That's what makes this moment in time so pivotal. We're living in a period of intense environmental change. The question is whether we learn from history or repeat it. There's also something deeply philosophical here, a kind of cosmic vulnerability that the Earth, so massive, so enduring, 
can teeter so close to oblivion and then pull itself back. That fragility is humbling. And yet, life did return. From that devastation emerged new lineages, early archosaurs, forerunners of the dinosaurs, and eventually mammals. So again, we see that same pattern. Death gives rise to new possibilities. But it comes at a price. And the great dying was the steepest price life has ever paid. You know, this talk of runaway warming, atmosphere collapse, and planetary tipping points, it reminds me of something else. Venus? Yes. Venus is Earth's evil twin. Roughly the same size, same mass, even formed from similar planetary ingredients. But while Earth became a cradle for life, Venus turned into an inferno. And understanding why might be one of the most important lessons we have. I read somewhere that Venus might once have had oceans. That's a leading theory. For the first few hundred million years, it could have been surprisingly Earth-like. Liquid water, clouds, perhaps even mild weather. But something tipped the balance. A runaway greenhouse effect? So it's not just hot. Venus is the hottest planet in the solar system. Hotter than Mercury, despite being farther from the sun. The average surface temperature is around 464 degrees C. That's hot enough to melt lead. And it stays that way, day or night, pole to pole. And the atmosphere? What's it made of? Mostly carbon dioxide, with thick clouds of sulfuric acid. The pressure at the surface is more than 90 times what we experience on Earth. It's like being 900 meters underwater. Add to that acid rain and a sky that never sees blue, and you've got a planet that feels more like myth than science. But what made it turn? What went wrong? We don't know exactly, but there's strong evidence that volcanoes played a major role, releasing enormous volumes of CO2. Once the greenhouse gases started trapping heat, the oceans evaporated. And here's the twist. Water vapor is itself a greenhouse gas. So the more it heated, the more water turned to steam, which made it heat even more? Exactly, a feedback loop. Eventually, all surface water was lost to space. The carbon cycle collapsed, and there was no way to cool down. Venus became a permanent pressure cooker. That feedback loop sounds familiar. Are we in one now? Not at Venusian scale, but we're seeing signs. Arctic permafrost melting, releasing methane, warming oceans, forests that once absorbed CO2 now burning and releasing it. These are early echoes of a Venus-like spiral. It's strange to think of another planet as a ghost of our possible future. That's exactly what it is. Venus isn't just a scientific curiosity. It's a cosmic warning, a monument to what can happen when atmospheric systems destabilize. And in a way, it's sobering. Because Venus didn't have industry, or coal plants, or SUVs. No, it happened through natural processes, volcanoes, orbital shifts, solar radiation. We, on the other hand, are forcing similar outcomes, but faster and knowingly. So if Earth were to tip, it wouldn't take millions of years. It could happen in centuries. And once those tipping points are crossed, there's no turning back. The planet doesn't owe us a safe climate. But that's what makes this moment different. Unlike Venus, we know what's happening. We have the tools to stop it. That's the hopeful part. Knowledge is our advantage, but awareness isn't enough. We need action. It almost makes me feel like we're standing at a fork in the cosmic road. Earth or Venus, recovery or ruin. That's a powerful image. Two sister planets, one alive and teeming, one scorched and silent. So we ask ourselves, which one do we want to become? So let's take a breath. We've traveled from ancient oceans to volcanic hellscapes, and even crossed space to glimpse a warning in the sky. What have we learned so far? We've seen that extinction isn't rare. 
It's woven into the fabric of life on Earth. Five times now, ecosystems have collapsed, sometimes slowly, like in the Devonian, sometimes all at once, like the great dying. And each time, the causes were different, but the outcome was the same. Life changed forever. In the Ordovician, it was global cooling, glaciers pulling down sea levels and destroying shallow marine habitats. Then the Devonian, where new plant life on land fed the oceans too many nutrients and triggered suffocating dead zones. Then came the Permian, the worst extinction in Earth's history. Triggered by volcanoes and amplified by greenhouse gases, it turned the entire planet hostile to life. And we can't ignore the resonance with today's world. Our oceans are warming, coral reefs are bleaching, greenhouse gases are rising, faster than at almost any point in Earth's history. And then there's Venus, the world that didn't pull back from the brink. No, it didn't. A cosmic mirror showing us what happens when a feedback loop runs wild. Venus is the end game of climate gone unchecked. But Earth isn't Venus, not yet. And the fact that we can have this conversation at all, that we can learn from geology, from atmosphere, from space, that's what gives us hope. So let's keep going, because the story of extinction, it's not finished yet. The Great Dying shows us how close life on Earth has come to ending. Venus shows us something even harder to face, a planet that crossed its thresholds and never returned. Together, they tell a deeper story, that habitability isn't guaranteed, that stability is fragile, and that life exists within narrow, precious margins. Earth is not isolated. It's part of a wider system, shaped by physics, atmosphere, chemistry, and time, the same forces that govern every world in our solar system. And understanding those worlds isn't a distraction from understanding ourselves. It's how we learn what kind of planet we are and what kind of future is still possible.